A card was founded in 1999 in a suburb of Munich, Germany. The company, started by a venture capital firm, was in the business of payments processing, which in simple terms means that they help websites collect payments from customers. Over recent years, this sector has become an extremely profitable business due to the popularity of online services. Competitors of Wirecard include multinationals such as PayPal, Mastercard, Visa and so on. In 2002, as a result of the dot-com bubble, the company was in deep financial trouble and on the verge of filing for bankruptcy. This is where the most charismatic character of this story appears on the scene. That is Marcus Braun. It was during that time of deep financial trouble that Marcus Braun, a former accountant, injected capital into Wirecard and took over the operations as CEO, focusing the core business on online payments for gambling and porn websites. Yes, you heard it right. At the beginning, Wirecard was acting as payment support for what you could describe as the less glamorous or less desirable businesses. That clearly started the legend of Braun in Germany as a saviour of Wirecard and a visionary entrepreneur. A few years after Marcus Braun took the helm, the German company went public on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange market by using an existing listed company. We don't want to get too technical here. The key point that's important you understand is that using a reverse initial public offering mechanism allowed Wirecard to avoid scrutiny from the German regulatory authorities, which certainly would have not have given the green light for listing. But back to our story. To sum up, Wirecard had been absorbed by a public listed company, becoming itself a listed company and changing the name of the absorber into Wirecard. As mentioned before, the main benefit of such a transaction is to avoid being subject to the deep scrutiny by the relevant authorities. And just for your information, another case of reverse IPO was Parmalat, the giant Italian company, which still as of today represents the biggest financial fraud in Europe. This doesn't mean every reverse IPO is bad, but it has been one of the ways that people use to access the capital markets with less scrutiny on their businesses, which can be good, but also bad, based on what's going on in the business itself. However, let's get back to Wirecard. The company went public in a non-traditional way, and they were involved in several uncommon payment businesses, including collecting money for gambling and pornographic businesses on the internet. Would you believe that with such tricky and questionable beginnings, Wirecard would have become a darling in European and global markets, attracting interest from many sophisticated investors across the world. In 2006, once it had gone public, Wirecard acquired a banking business called Xcom and consequently was allowed to both process payments for merchants but also to issue credit cards. And this is the key to our story because having the second arm of the business makes the accounting and financial statements of the business very complicated and allows Marcus Braun and his management team to have investors rely increasingly on their explanations of the financial reporting. It's like you telling investors the accounting of my company is super complicated because we have these two businesses that are so different. But trust me, I've done the work and have simplified it for you. You can do all this work and find out for yourself or you can take my word for it and have a much simpler life. Now, if that was a discussion you had with someone owning a nail salon or a barber shop, your antennae would be up. But if you're talking to the CEO of a public company, you assume that someone else has been checking this company before. And that's where the whole trust in others doing their job mantra gets people hooked and later on in deep trouble. From 2010 to 2014, Wirecard raised more than 500 million euros in capital from its shareholders and commenced buying several companies across Asia. In view of this expansion, Wirecard set up its Asian headquarters in Singapore. Although Wirecard appeared to be doing very well and projected itself as a financially sound company, some market commentators and notably some short sellers started raising concerns and doubts about its solidity. A couple of capital market experts commented 
that the company's footprint in Asia was smaller than what had been presented, and a reputable investor who published its views under the codename Zatara began accusing the company of being involved in money laundering activities. Now, you may be wondering, why did someone use a code name to criticize the company? Well, the reason is that people were concerned of the consequences of calling Wirecard out. In fact, after these allegations against Wirecard emerged, phishing efforts and hacking campaigns against those who expressed perplexity about Wirecard commenced, causing disruption to their businesses and affecting their reputations. There is no clear evidence on who was launching the hacks, and it's not our intent to accuse anybody. However, it has been highlighted by several journalists that the timing is very interesting to say the least. Another weird coincidence is that each target of this hacking campaign has somehow criticized or promoted doubts on the real financial situation of Wirecard. And you may think, where were the auditors? Was anyone checking on this company carefully? As recently as 2017, the company's auditor gave it a clean audit and the company acquired Citibank's payments operation across 11 countries in Asia. Wirecard started to be very well known in the region. The company was able to borrow over 100 million euros from Deutsche Bank. In 2018, this very rosy picture starts to crack. An internal investigation into the company's Singapore headquarters is launched, claiming that the company may be involved in an accounting scheme technically known as round-tripping. A simple definition of round-tripping is a strategy used by businesses who sell an asset to another business with an agreement that the asset will be bought back at a time in the future. This scheme allows a company to increase the apparent amount of revenue that has been made during a specific period of time. However, not everyone is aware of what may be going on at the company. It is apparent success continues to increase to the point Wirecard became larger than Deutsche Bank or Commerzbank, two of the largest German banks. And Wirecard even took Commerzbank's place in Germany's most coveted index called the DAX 30. When it did, that helped Wirecard increase its prominence in the country and globally, because it was able to attract a significant amount of new investors as a result of its inclusion in the index. In early 2019, reports continued, indicating that something is wrong with the company. Wirecard insists that nothing bad's happening, and they use their lawyers to attack anyone making claims against them. Even the German market regulators start investigating journalists and short sellers, because they think someone is engaging in market manipulation to undermine Wirecard. That shows you how important, trusted, and respected a company like Wirecard had become in the world, and certainly in Germany. Some brave journalists continued the quest for truth at their own risk. Although not funny then, one of the related stories that I find entertaining is that some journalists, trying to prove something strange was going on around Wirecard, ended up going to one of Wirecard's locations in Asia, and to his utter surprise, found out that a regular family lived at a location that should have been part of the company's operation. Imagine someone knocking on your door and asking you where all the employees of Wirecard are. As recently as April 2019, SoftBank invested 900 million euros in the company, bolstering public trust in the viability of the business. Fast forward a few months, everyone is eagerly awaiting a report from the auditors of the company that is due in March and gets postponed to April 2019. When the report gets eventually published, the auditor says they cannot verify a large part of Wirecard's reported profits from 2016 to 2018. It appears that nearly 2 billion US dollars are missing. Now, that's quite a bit of cash to be missing, don't you think? The stock tanks upon issuance of this report as many had started to suspect that something nefarious was going on at the company. A slew of police actions follows both in Asia and in Germany, which culminates with the arrest of Marcus Braun on the 23rd of June 2020, days after he resigned from his post as chief executive officer. 
This happened in a very developed economy like Germany, with a strong regulatory oversight of companies. One of the reasons people think this could happen was the admiration and cult-like following that surrounded Wirecard's CEO. Marcus Braun, like many other recent alleged fraudsters, used the imagery and manners of Steve Jobs to create an aura of success. Do you remember Elizabeth Holmes? She likes to present herself and even dress very similarly to Steve Jobs. And funnily enough, her company, Tyrannos, was also found to be a fraud by investigators after having been a darling of many market commentators. Another reason is that the German authorities and Wirecard itself was extremely harsh in making anyone who doubted their business bear the consequences of that. It's important to note that investigations are still ongoing and it has not yet been determined whether or not Wirecard's founder did anything that was illegal. However, this is another very big financial scandal of recent times with the notable characteristic that it appears that some of the watchdogs in Germany either didn't want to see what was going on or somewhat protected Wirecard from accusations because it viewed the company as a national champion. This is Germany's Enron. Some of you will remember the very big accounting scandal that hit American giant Enron many years ago. In addition to Marcus Braun, another top executive at Wirecard, the chief operations officer called Jan Marsalek, may be able to help us all figure out what happened at Wirecard. He too, like Marcus Braun, is Austrian. He's in his 40s and is always well-dressed in top-notch Italian suits. People say he was very secretive and obsessed with security. He played a big role in Wirecard's Asian expansion and was Braun's most trusted colleague. Unfortunately, he went missing shortly after the auditors disclosed that $2 billion were missing from Wirecard. Despite the fact Marsalek has become one of the most wanted people on the planet, it seems that nobody can locate him. He was last traced in Minsk, and now it seems that he has been hiding in Russia. Now that is a big development in this story. Is it true that he is in Russia? And if it is true, why would the Russians help him hide? The plot thickens. Is this about financial fraud and greed for money? Or is there more to it? Spies, money laundering, crime. What else could have been going on at Wirecard? We don't know, but what we can assure you of is that we'll keep tabs on the situation.